Scott Laborde and welcome to Steppin' Out, spotlighting the New Orleans area's arts and entertainment scene. And seated at our table tonight, Ian McNulty, restaurant writer for the New Orleans Advocate. Hey, hey good Peggy. to see you. Oh, Hello. Great to be here. Thank you. Yes, indeed. We're th delighted you're here. And Troy Poplis making his Steppin' Out debut, yes. director of hair, a longtime teacher at McDonough 35. Certainly. And, Thank and many, you. many other things. But Thank we're looking you. forward to We're going to have two excerpts, two songs from hair a little later in our show. Alan Smason, editor of the online Crescent City Jewish News. And we just want to say that we look forward to seeing Poppy back very, very soon. We miss her, but we're delighted to have you here, but we miss you, Poppy. <laughs> so anyway, let's turn to Ian with some restaurant news. Yeah, that's right, Peggy. You know, uh, every Wednesday in the New Orleans Advocate, we've been doing uh, what I call a kind of the, the, the sports page for New Orleans foodies, where we kind of dissect what's happening in the in the restaurant scene around the city. And boy, there is so much happening. It seems like every corner of the restaurant world in New Orleans is up for some sort of refresh or redo or new look or, or just, you know, classic elegance. It, it, it's, it's really an exciting beat to cover. And the one that I wanted to zero in on today is the Vietnamese restaurant scene. We've had a robust Vietnamese restaurant scene in the city for a long time. Uh, but for many, many years, it was kind of focused in New Orleans East and uh, on the West Bank and Gretna, around those areas where kind of the ethnic enclaves of, of Vietnamese communities were. Well, they've spread all over the city, as you've probably seen. I mean, they're all, all these restaurants are all over Uptown now. They're throughout Metairie. Uh, but what's particularly interesting, and what I'm going to showcase today, is the way that um, many of the newer ones are going pretty far off the normal script. A lot of these casual Vietnamese places, they have pho, which is that soup. They have the spring rolls. They have the banh mi, which are the po' boys. But this next generation, often run by the younger generation, are really doing some different stuff. The first one we're going to look at is called Bachi Canteen, and that opened this spring uh, on, on Maple Street. Some people will know the address as the Old Figaro's. Oh, oh sure, okay. yeah, sure. Yeah, it was there for years. Uh, well, this is a new place, uh, like I said, just opened the spring, and uh, it has a, you know, kind of a cool, casual look. It's BYOB, it's near the universities. Um, they have the normal stuff, the soup, the noodle dishes, the spring rolls, but then these dishes that are come from the chef's imagination, a little bit from the sushi bar, a little bit from kind of a Pan-Asian approach. These are uh, mussels with kimchi, of course, that uh, Korean spicy cabbage over the top, and seaweed like you'd find at a sushi bar, uh, not stuff you're going to normally see in a in a Vietnamese restaurant. And this is one of the chef's creations. These things are all over the menu. This one is called the gyoza nacho. And it's <laughs> gyoza, which are the Japanese dumplings you see in all kinds of Japanese restaurants, treated like a plate of nachos, basically, with like jalapeno <laughs> peppers and all these sauces. Really delicious. Right around the corner, right nearby, is another place called Pho Bistro. And uh, this is an, actually in an old Whitney Bank building. It's seen a number of restaurants come through it. Uh, but this, this place does, again, uh, they start off with the traditional, familiar Vietnamese restaurant stuff. But then they put their own spin on some of them. And one of the specialties there are these banh mi tacos. Basically, they're <laughs> all, all right. the stuff that would go inside of a banh mi Vietnamese po' boy. The roasted pork, all the fresh vegetables, pickled vegetables, hot sauce, hot peppers, wrapped up in flour tortillas. And they do a few other things like that that are fun, too. They take like one of those fresh rice paper rolls, wrap it up in a uh, crispy fried roll so you get sort of a double-decker effect. Fun stuff to explore. The next one is in Metairie. It's called Pho Orchid Express. This is on Airline <laughs> Drive, uh -huh. and uh, there's like sort of a bigger uh, Pho Orchid over by Clearview in that area. This is a much smaller, quick serve, almost deli style, and um, you know it, it's designed from the inside out to be about um, quick service, get in and out, kind of kind of catering to the younger generation. And uh, the dishes also, you know, go a little bit off script. There's uh, their take on Vietnamese tacos are made with these little uh, like rice flour, rice flour steamed buns mm. that they stuff mm. with, you know, whatever you want. Uh, these are little bite-sized things. They're almost like sliders. If you think about slider burgers, they're very similar to that. And another dish here that kind of stood out for me uh, is basically steak and eggs, <laughs> but Vietnamese style. So this arrives on the sizzling plate. The eggs are cooking right in front of you. Uh, you got a little salad on the side. There's a baguette over there. A, a, a good uh, Vietnamese-style beef cooked with onions. Really interesting, different uh, from your, your standards there. And then finally, we're going back to the River Bend, uh, a place called Jasmine Cafe. Now it's been here for a few years, uh, right, right, literally right at the at the River Bend, where the where the, where the road takes its turn there. Uh, and what's different about this place is they've recently added essentially a sushi bar to do spring rolls. So they've combined like those fresh rice flour, uh, rice paper spring rolls with all the makings from a sushi bar. So you have 
you know, your rice noodles wrapped in raw fish and mm. raw tuna and raw salmon, uh, crab meat, all kinds of different varieties. The list goes on and on. So if you are interested in Vietnamese cuisine, and a lot more people are getting to know the standards, if you go to some of these newer second generation places, there's a lot more to explore. So it's a really interesting time. Well, you know, nobody has an excuse anymore to say pho. You've no, got that's to right. know now that it's pho. Yeah, it is okay. pho. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> there's just there's no excuse because everybody's been around long enough right. for that. Yeah, you know? and they will help you with the pronunciation at the restaurants. They'll, they'll tell you all kinds of fun things that it rhymes like or sounds like if you just ask. <laughs> but the other thing is how the Vietnamese community really changed the face of part of the bakery scene. Oh, yes. That's a whole other story, Peggy. I mean, there's French bakers and then there's Vietnamese French bakers. They say like the, the second best hub for French baking outside of France is Vietnam. And a lot of uh, a lot of Vietnamese people in New Orleans have brought that tradition with them. So terrific bakeries all over town. Do you have a favorite? I have several. <laughs> uh, there's one, Odalise, uptown. I love this place. It's a traditional, classic, just beautiful cakes and pastries. Uh, also, on the West Bank, there's High Dough Bakery. Oh, they make, that's been there for yeah. a while. Yeah, great yeah. rolls, great yeah. breads, great king cakes, actually, great pastries. And of course, out in the east, there's Dong Phong, which is the you know the font for all that banh mi bread. But the interesting thing is how many places are using that Vietnamese-style French bread that have no other correlation to Vietnamese food on their menus. They're turning up everywhere. Any traditional po' boy shops even are using it sometimes. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's it's good. very interesting. Also, in Mid-City, uh, neighborhood dear to our hearts, um, there's some neighborhood <laughs> grocery stores that also have a lot of the, of the banh mi, don't they? Yeah, there's one kind of a surprising one. It's on the corner of Broad and Canal, and it's called Eat Well Food Store. And it just looks like any old sort of convenience store that you'd see uh, next to a, a streetcar stop in this case. Uh, but look at the signs. In addition to the lottery signs and the beer signs, there's a little sign for pho and for banh mi. And you go in, and then the back and the deli there, uh, right next to all the other you know, standards, the gumbo and the fried shrimp po' boys, uh, you can get one of these banh mi po' boys or a big takeaway carton of fuss. So it's, you know, the, the, city's, the city's food culture is a, is a very dynamic, interesting place. It's just really fun to be covering it right now. Great. Well, thank you. We're glad that you're here. And we turn to Troy. Well, Troy, how did you decide that you wanted to do hair? So where, what is the genesis of this? Well, got a call from uh, Cassie Worley, who's the executive director for uh, Le Petit, and um, I jumped at the, the opportunity. Uh, to direct the hair about 20 some odd years ago, I, I played the role of HUD oh. and uh, never thought that I would have an opportunity to direct it ever in my life. But um, it presented itself and I'm happy that I did. Now one thing, um, I, I saw the, pro, the, the, um, the show and enjoyed it immensely. And one thing I didn't miss, but we want people to know in case they're looking for it, is the nude scene. Yes, <laughs> yes, there's no nude scene. <laughs> <laughs> and it gets uh, a, a pretty big um, hoorah and some other things in the beginning of the show when Cassie mm -hmm. comes out and, and exclaims that there's no nudity in the <laughs> show. So um, it's mixed feelings, but uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a different time, and I don't think that it's really missed. Well, also, uh, fairly timeless are, are, the, are the songs. And even though, you know, for some of us it may seem uh, nostalgic, but there are new audiences looking at this show for the yes. first time. Yes. Huh? There are a lot of people that I, I, I realize they're not familiar with the show at all. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I, I was not quite aware of that myself. And uh, it was surprising and had the great opportunity to, to bring a, a familiar work uh, to the forefront and have them see it for the first time. Yeah. Now, you have brought your wonderful cast. What is the, the, um, the process in terms of rehearsal? How long have you all been rehearsing? Well, it's, it's been an off and on process. Um, being an educator, I, I, I'd like to, to get all of the information out first. Uh, because it's a pretty young group of, of, of artists that are on stage and um, give them all of the information as it relates to the period and the time and what was going on and the history and the music. And uh, so from September uh, until now, it's just been mm. an off mm -hmm. and on process. And well, in addition to a talented cast, it was really fun to see what they're wearing. Yeah. And obviously, special care was taken for that, too. Certainly. Uh, Rose Charlotte Raphael, who's our costume designer, uh, she and I sat and we discussed um, the look. And uh, I think it, it turned out pretty well. The, the, the cast, they look phenomenal. And they love dressing up, this group of folks. So, <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's been pretty 
good experience. Now you're at McDonough 35? Yes, I, I teach at McDonough 35. I, I also, I'm a graduate of McDonough 35 and I had the wonderful privilege of uh, going back maybe 15 years ago and teach at my alma mater. Well please set up what we're going to hear. Uh, this particular piece is uh, Aquarius led by uh, Idella Johnson and the tribe. Uh, it's the first song of the show. All right, well let's hear a little bit of the age of Aquarius. in just a little while, but thank you. Sounded great and looked great, too. Absolutely. With outfits like that, you can see why they didn't need the nude scene. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And we turn to Alan. Mr. Days of Mr. Darcy. And yes. Some. Yes. We're going to talk a lot about Pride and Prejudice to start off. And I know that there's a, a culture for people who are familiar with Pride and Prejudice and Jane Austen's works that seems to be going, uh, I guess you might say by leaps and bounds, it's growing because they even had a movie that just came out about Austen mania and all the people that are, are so behind Pride and Prejudice. This particular uh, uh, production that we're talking about is Pride and Prejudice and it's going to be at a very unusual venue. This is at Ursuline campus uptown uh, 3625 uh, State Street and this is the first time that Southern Repertory has actually appeared there but it is a fabulous venue. They have many many beautiful seats there that you can sit in it's very comfortable and I have to say that this is a, a very stellar cast that we're looking at not only do you have Ashley record Santos in the role of Elizabeth Bennett and Michael Stone uh, as Mr. Darcy but you've got several other people in here including uh, Martin Covert in a lesser role of, of uh, actually a couple of roles that he's doing you've got Rebecca Frank as Mrs. Bennett Phil Carnell does a good job as uh, Mr. Bennett the father Kristen Wittershine's great as Jane Bennett and Becca Chapman and Emily Russell is a couple of the sisters there. They're really uh, doing a great job at what I think is, is a really super play. Uh, this is the one that was done by John Jury. Now, John Jury, people know, uh, is the uh, director, uh, past director from uh, the uh, Louisville Actors Theater, uh, has been very involved with new plays and on the network that's involved nationwide. But I think, you know, the, the two big stars, of course, are Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy, and those two, that is uh, Ashley and uh, Michael, do a wonderful job. I think anybody who is a, a fan of the book will love this production. And uh, again, I think that hats off to uh, the directors, of course, uh, none other than uh, the, the very eminently qualified and talented 
uh, Amy Hayes and Jeffrey Gonchol, who are doing uh, their part in keeping this production together. And, and I think Cecile also, uh, Cecile Covert should be uh, congratulated on the uh, wonderful costume that they did. You'll love it. Go check it out. Again, it's at the Ursuline campus, and I suggest that you try either to park on campus. It's, I think, $5 to park or somewhere around the block in the uptown area. Pride and Prejudice. Okay, moving on. I also got a chance to see the very moving play by Katori Hall this past week. This is finally, uh, it had to be held up for a week due to some problems with uh, construction. But uh, Anthony Bean Theater is presenting The Mountaintop. This, of course, is the story of the last night on earth of Martin Luther King and uh, a visitor to his hotel room in Memphis at uh, the Lorraine Hotel. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, Anthony carries off the role very well. There were uh, some excellent uh, moments there between the maid, if you will, uh, played by Monica Harris and uh, Anthony, but she's not really all that she seems to be. She's going to deliver some food for him. He's just come in delivering that famous mountaintop speech, I've been to the mountaintop, and uh, he's tired, and he doesn't realize until she informs him, perhaps, that uh, she's a little bit more than just a messenger delivering soup. And so uh, Katori Hall uh, uh, had this particular play on Broadway for two years, starring Samuel L. Jackson and Alfred Woodward. A wonderful play. There were a few technical problems that I would remind everybody to be a little bit maybe uh, considerate of uh, when you go there. Uh, they do have, uh, at the end of the play, some very interesting video that, that Martin Luther King views uh, after his life is uh, over. And uh, essentially, uh, he gets to see some of the changes, including, of course, the very important election of Barack Obama as President of the United States. So, uh, again, I think that those of you who are uh, knowledgeable of, of the life uh, of Martin Luther King and those of you who aren't are going to find a lot about this. And Katori Hall did a great job in bringing that character to life uh, so that we could really get to know him as a man, not just as an icon and, and a, uh, a major figure. Also, coming up this week, Ghost, the musical, based, of course, on the 1980s film that you may remember with Whoopi Goldberg and, and Demi Moore. Uh, this particular uh, uh, incursion, if you will, is written by the very same person who wrote the movie. Uh, and again, uh, those of you who uh, are, are looking right now at the picture, that's Stephen Grant Douglas and, and Katie Post. Uh, they are uh, essentially the young married couple uh, who are involved in this. Uh, they're deeply in love and, and following a mugging, of course, that goes wrong. Um, the male character is, is sort of killed off, and, and we then get to see him experiencing life as a ghost. Uh, those of you who are in the know will know uh, that uh, the Sanger Theater is where it's being presented, as all the Broadway musicals now are, and it starts up this Tuesday night. I'm looking forward to being there, and I hope that uh, many people will get a chance to see this wonderful production. should be great. I'll have a review on it hopefully next week. Also, what's happening next week? Well, it's all in one word, and that word is Fringe. The Fringe Festival starts up on the 20th of the month and will go, I think, until the 24th. It's, I believe, five days full of, of presentations, 76 plays. I mm. uh, wanted to tell you about one of them first off because I got a chance to see this one, and this is the Skin Horse Theater production of Nocturnes 1 through 3. This is, uh, a, I guess you might say, a, a presentation that tries to, there's Mission Control, tries to show you what it's like to be an outer space or be affected by space. This is the very first of three different scenes. They have a prelude and, and a finale, which take place in a train station. But the second and third parts uh, are, are, are quite interesting. Uh, it is a representation of not only space and gravity. You, you have this wonderful balletic uh, movement of the, of the uh, people who are in it. Evan Spiegelman and Shannon Flaherty, for instance, are astronauts. And the other characters are, are, are in black, uh, draped completely so you can't see them. And the pieces of paper that move, as it were, with no gravity through the air because they're being held by the other actors, et cetera. It's just amazing. It's, 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 it's ballet at its best. It took them months to uh, be able to choreograph it, and I really would recommend it very highly. Also, some wonderful lighting effects and some smoke. If you have a problem about smoke in the theater, uh, you may uh, have a problem with this production, but I would recommend you go to it because it's really neat. Now, some of the other offerings for uh, the uh, uh, Fringe Festival for this next uh, week. Antebellum, this is a performance art. You, you know, a lot of times they'll have dance artists that'll be presented. Antebellum uh, takes place, obviously, in the Old South, if you will. Then we have The Rendezvous. Uh, this, again, is uh, again going to be more of a feature dealing with dance and performance art. Then Nightmares, they recommend as well. 
some of these productions I can't really go into too much detail because uh, <laughs> they're hard to describe. But you can tell by that we want all the picture. details. <laughs> Obscura is about a magician, uh, and, and they say that this uh, particular performance is super, that he does not only some great magic tricks, but uh, uh, keeps the audience uh, uh, quite entertained. And then uh, last but not least, the NOLA Project is presenting the uh, Oregon Trail. And, and this is based not on the Oregon Trail that you might uh, imagine of the Old West, but it's based on the computer game that came out back in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. If you may remember, one of, the, one of the bylines of it was, you have died of dysentery. So <laughs> the idea was to, to stay alive on the Oregon Trail. And so the Fringe Festival, starting up the 76 shows, uh, I believe they have uh, uh, something along the lines of 14 uh, uh, venues that are, are for the fringe that are official and then 52 that are going to be bring your own venues you buy uh, a, a pin and you get a chance to go around to the different venues most of them located in the Marigny and in the Faubourg area but there are other places and you get to go to the Always Theater and the Shadow Box and some of these other places that are around there that uh, are hard to describe in terms of some of them are, are venues that would never be used for a theater again isn't it nice to see St. Claude, that's St. Yes. Claude Avenue oh, corridor yes. and all the great a things? Absolutely. There. I'm just amazed uh, just about the amount of, of uh, traffic that the streets bear during this time. It's, it's, it's only a few days, and all of these different little small clubs and bars, et cetera, they become theater venues. It's, it's, it's <laughs> wonderful. Now, the, the uh, Fringe Festival is going to be centered also along that, that area where the Crew of Muses Den is, if you know, in that, that area uh, in the Faubourg. So uh, they're, they're having several presentations there. They did last year Wolves presented okay. by Southern Rep. So yeah. go to the website for more information. Absolutely. Okay, thank All you right. very much. And now it is time for our artist spotlight. Tonight we're featuring two pieces. The first is titled Bluest Moon by photographer Ellis Lucia, a New Orleans native. Lucia, a very familiar name. He was a staff photographer at the Times Picayune for 37 years. Amazing. Beautiful, beautiful. And this next piece is titled McNeely Oak. That's by painter Kathy Miller Stone, based in Baton Rouge. Stone paints in transparent watercolor, using many unusual colors to brighten shadows. Both are included in the group exhibit, The Calligraphy of Trees. It includes 13 local and regional artists and runs through December the 8th at the Garden District Gallery. Call 891-3032 or visit GardenDistrictGallery.com for more info. A reminder that you can check out Steppin' Out's online calendar at WYES.org. New Orleans Magazine's quiz queen, Julia Street, has a question for us. Last time, Wendy Delery Hills gave us the names of two area Mississippi River bridges, one named after a former governor and the other after a song written by a former governor, UEP Long, <laughs> and the Sunshine Bridge. Now, tonight's question. Okay. John James Audubon spent much of his time in Louisiana living on a plantation. What was the plantation and what town is it near? Send your answers to Steppin' Out at WYES.org. Our prizes, a Louisiana Life magazine subscription, a gift certificate for Vianne's Tea House, offering their culinary and gourmet tea experience for two. A copy of the book Statuesque New Orleans by Ashley Merlin. Tonight we have a t-shirt worn by WYES staffer Errol Mullaney's. The message, life's a breeze. Hmm, yes indeed for Mr. <laughs> breeze, he sure is. And that of course is our, uh, from our friends at wearablevegetables.com. So now our picks, Ian. Well, speaking of the Saints, Everyone knows what Thursday night is. That's when the Saints are going to beat the Falcants again. But <laughs> there's more going on in town that night, it turns out, uh -huh. including what they're dubbing the Black and Gold Beaujolais. This is uh, the debut of the Beaujolais wine. They do every year on the third Thursday of November all over the world. Uh, they're doing it in New Orleans. They're not letting the fact that it's a Saints night stop them, but they are going to be showing the Saints game. So that's the JW Marriott on Thursday. Starts at 7. You can get your tickets online. This is done by the French American Chamber of Commerce. And if you're fan of that uh, light, fruity uh, French red wine. This is the best chance to sample All it. Right, great. Troy? Uh, I had an opportunity yesterday to view um, Zoo Man and the Sign at Dillard University. Um, great show, urban um, violence show, much about what's in the headlines today. It's at Cook uh, Theater there. All right, thank yes. you. I'm surprised you're not mentioning St. Baldrick's, but he's going to do a thing for St. Baldrick's. <laughs> he's going to get rid of his hair, the director oh, of hair, oh, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, I want to remind everybody who's not going to see the Patty LuPone show 
show on Saturday night that the LPO, Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra, will be presenting Randy Jackson with the music of the doors. All right. Mahalia Jackson Theater. Thank you. And my picks tomorrow, shop away in the Vieux Carré and stay for the lighting of the French Market Christmas tree. That's all a day activities from 10 to 7, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. that is, with the tree lighting at 6 o'clock in the Washington Artillery Park on Decatur Street. Go to frenchmarket.org for more information. And on Monday at 5 o'clock, Harry Shearer gives a discussion on the mechanics of comedy in a public forum at Loyola University. And you can visit their calendar, and we have that up on the screen. Check that out at Loino, and you see all the information here. And we're so excited <laughs> because next Wednesday night at 7 and 9 o'clock on WYS, we have the premiere of our new documentary, Audubon Park Memories. If you remember the swan boat <laughs> and the zoo key, you know, all of that. And then also next Friday, explore literary and historical New Orleans with a spiked scavenger hunt. And that's through a one-of-a-kind bookstores around the quarter literary landmarks of the French Quarter, of course. And the event is called Books and Booze. And go to TennesseeWilliams.net for all the details on that. You have to register. Now, who, what are we going to hear next here as we close out? Uh, the next song is uh, Where Do I Go? led by one of our leads, uh, Kurt Gangan, right. uh, who plays the role of uh, Claude. All right, and thank you all very much for being here. Thank you very much for the cast, and let's hear Kirk and the cast of Where Do I Go? Thanks for watching. Good night. <laughs> Follow the goals. Where is the something? Where is the someone that tells me why I live and die? Where do I go? Follow the children. Where do I go? Follow their smiles. Is there an answer? Where do I go? Follow my head.